My name is Lily. I'm a front-end developer and a partner at Perrin, a boutique software consultancy. About three years ago, I came to know this language called ClojureScript. After experimenting with it, I decided to make a transition from JavaScript to ClojureScript. And I'm here to talk about why I made that transition and why you should consider ClojureScript too. First, let's start with what is ClojureScript. ClojureScript is a dialect of Clojure. Clojure compiles to JVM bytecode. ClojureScript compiles to JavaScript. ClojureScript is a Lisp. It is functional. And it is a dynamic like, dynamically typed compiled language. So ClojureScript is not just a syntactic sugar on top of JavaScript, like TypeScript or CoffeeScript. With TypeScript or CoffeeScript, if you already know JavaScript, you are going to learn them in a day or two. They offer very similar language structures, similar syntax, and the same mental model as JavaScript. ClojureScript is fundamentally different than JavaScript. Just because it's compiled to JavaScript, you cannot categorize it with TypeScript. It's a different beast. Think of it as an entirely different language, like Ruby or Python or Scala, that's able to compile to JavaScript. Now, I'm going to talk about why these characteristics make ClojureScript a compelling choice for front-end development. When you think about Lisp, the first thing that you will probably think about is parentheses, right? Lisp has been with us for a long time. In fact, it is the second oldest high-level programming language, just a year shy from Fortran. But yet, people are still using it today. Lisp stands for list processing. We'll talk in more detail later what it means for list processing. But let's take a minute to see what Lisp looks like. In JavaScript, a function call looks like this. You have operator with invocation of arguments. In Lisp, function call starts with operator followed by arguments and parentheses around them. So you can chain operation like so. The result of the first one would be one, two, three, and four. Its conditional operation looks like this. First return value is for when condition is met, and second return value is when condition isn't met. There is no if, if else, else is, none of that. Everything is just a list. As you can see here, we're just processing list of data. That is what Lisp does. One of the defining characteristics of Lisp is its homo iconicity. Homo iconicity means code and data are in the same format. So machine can just treat code as data. JS has special syntax to differentiate what is code and what is data, like var or function and so on are code. Brackets are for data. Square brackets for array curly brackets for object. Lisp has no special syntax. Everything is a list, whether it's data or code, and that is homo iconic city. Let's look at an example here. I define my list as a list of one, two, three. Then I call map on the list to manipulate it. Map is also in a list. First argument is a function and second argument is a reference to the list I defined above. Lisp is easy for machine to process. We know that. It can just process the same code the same way as it would process any data structure. Believe it or not, Lisp is also easy for humans too. Unlike other languages, once you develop a mental model to work with Lisp, you can apply to anything because everything is just Lisp processing. This is something that takes a while to get used to if you aren't familiar with Lisp. But once you're used to it, you really appreciate the simplicity of Lisp. Unlike JS, Lisp syntax will never change. Because of the homo iconicity of Lisp, it is also extensible in nature. A big plus of this is that implementing macros in ClojureScript is a lot more feasible than in JavaScript. For those who aren't familiar with macros, the key differentiations, differentiations between macros and functions are that 
functions take data as inputs, macros take raw code as inputs. A list macro takes code and manipulates it instead of evaluating that code. Function runs at runtime, macros run before runtime. This is an example of how you would write macro in ClojureScript. First, you tell dev macro what you expect to get back. In this case, you wanted to output code to do JS alert and greet a new user. Then at macro expansion time, it would be expanded to JS alert hello new user, which then get called at runtime. Without macro, the hello function that only get calls once will be stored in the program memory. Remember in Lisp, code and data are in the same format. In JS, they aren't. That is why it's much harder to implement macros in JavaScript. So now you might ask, why do I have to care about macros, right? Let me give you an example. You are probably using ES7 async await, which is great. And you wish that you could have used it years ago. With JS, there are two ways to have something like that that isn't in the language. First, you wait for ECMA committee to include that into the ES standard and wait for browsers to support it. Or two, you could use a JS preprocessor like Babel and hope they have it implemented. ClojureScript has had something like async await since 2013, long before Babel had it. Because Lisp is extensible, a feature like async await can just be implemented by the community instead of a language maintainer. Async await in ClojureScript is just a library. So you, as a language user, can easily extend ClojureScript to include any good features that other languages have. Actually, much of ClojureScript, the language itself, is implementing, implemented using macros. You could also use macro to manage runtime versus compile time optimization. For example, if you need to do an expensive operation, like a network call during compile time, you could just write code to take care of that piece without sacrificing performance during runtime. With JS, you would need to use Webpack for that. So ClojureScript is a lot more flexible, and you can leverage the language to do more without using a bunch of other tools. ClojureScript is functional. In functional programming, functions are pure, no side effects, and data is immutable. If you are like me, and you're so on JavaScript, the good parts, you probably are already familiar with functional programming and perhaps already using JS in a functional way. Then ClojureScript isn't going to be foreign to you. If you aren't so on functional JavaScript, you should go read the book. How many of you here are using immutable JS with React? Okay, not a lot. For those who aren't familiar with immutable JS and are using React, you will probably notice that on the surface, React is very object oriented, but underneath is very functional. And that is why Facebook open sourced immutable JS and encourages people to use React with immutable data structures. On the left is how you would use immutable JS map. And on the right is ClojureScript immutable map. With ClojureScript immutable data structure, React performs better from the get go. When you write React with ClojureScript, every component is a pure component. When you change something in ClojureScript, it's always return a mutated copy of that something. So shallow equality always works. You also don't need to ment mentally keep track of which data is immutable and which is JS object, because every ClojureScript data structure is immutable. Again, with ClojureScript, you collaborate the language to do more, and you don't need to use other tools like immutable JS. Fun fact, the implementation of immutable JS data structures is based on ClojureScript. Compared to JavaScript, ClojureScript compiled tooling is a lot more robust. ClojureScript has advanced compilation, which utilizes Google Clojure compiler. Notice the J and the S in Clojure and Google Clojure. I know it's confusing, but they're totally different words and they're not related at all. Google Clojure compiler is the most advanced JS to JS compiler available. It has the best 
their code elimination and is built in to Clojure script. Google uses Clojure compiler internally on most of their notable products and is also open source. Here's how it works. Clojure script compiles to JavaScript using JVM and then uses Google Clojure compiler to compile that JS code to a minified JS code. The compiled JS can be run in any JavaScript context, browser, node, or in our recent use case, React Native. We'll be talking about our experience using Clojure Script with React Native after this talk, so come join us if you're interested. What's cool about Google Clojure Compiler is that it compiles your code down to only what you use and nothing else. For example, in file A, you have, a, you have imported a big YouTube file with hello function in it, but you only use hello once. Closure compiler will only include that function in your compiled code. In this case, because it can analyze the code, it eliminates the function call and replace it with the result. As you can see here, it trims out with just only alert. So Closure script compiled JS code with Google Closure compiler is going to be a lot smaller than any JS minifier out there. Utilizing Google Closure compiler is something that is lacking in the JS world. Google Closure compiler is not well documented. It is also not fun to write Google Closure compatible JS. You can only use a subset of JavaScript. You also need type annotation for everything that you write. And you can only statically access a property in an object. So no wonder Google Closure Compiler doesn't have much of an adoption in the JS community. With Closure Script, on the other hand, you get the benefit of Google Closure Compiler without the downsides. You have the nice interface to work with and the benefit of small compile production code. Now you might ask, but I'm using JavaScript. Why do I have to care about a compiler? Well, JavaScript is the biggest compile language to JavaScript. The JS code that you write isn't the JS code that the browser consumes. And if you think that the browser will catch up, and eventually you don't have to rely on a preprocessor anymore, but there will all going to be ES8, ES9, and if you want to be on that cutting edge, you will have to rely on a preprocessor. Since JS will always be a compile target, you might as well use a better design compiled to JS language. ClojureScript also provides JS interrupt, which means you can use any JS APIs and libraries. You can leverage the tooling provided by the JS ecosystem. You could also export your ClojureScript code to use with JS if you wanted to. Now what about debugging? This is the ClojureScript source map from Chrome Dev2. The cool thing is Google Chrome understands ClojureScript syntax highlighting without any plugin so you don't have to worry about debugging your code. In JS, you have hot reload through Webpack, but JS doesn't have a concept of namespace. The problem is that when something gets changed, the reloader doesn't understand the dependency graph fully due to dynamically requires and cannot easily replace all code due to closures. In closure script, namespaces are explicit and statically defined so the build tool can compile and reload just the part that gets changed would make um, reloads a lot faster. The Clojure community also embraces REPL driven development. It makes coding a lot more interactive. Here's a little demo of an Atom plugin called Proto REPL. It's very well illustrated what REPL driven, driven development looks like. You could also connect your editor to your web app in the browser to use REPL driven development. Okay. Now, if you're curious enough to give Closure Script a try, you might wonder how do I get started? Okay. If you're like me and you learn by doing, the first thing you'd want to do is set up your editor to be able to handle the parentheses. Because Lisp is written in data structures, it's, possi it's possible to do structural editing. Okay. 
This is something that you cannot easily do in JavaScript. This is a little demo of what structural editing looks like. Notice that parentheses and brackets are always balanced. The editor will ensure that you don't accidentally delete a delimiter. You could also manipulate the order of your code, as you can see in the video. If you learn more by reading, then Closure for the Brave and True is a great entry point into Closure. Simple Made Easy Talk is a talk uh, by Closure creator Rich Hickey. It's also a great place to start, as it's packed with fundamental design principles of Closure. Last, as front-end applications got more complex, it is going to get harder and harder for us to do our jobs. We spend a lot of time choosing third-party libraries or front-end frameworks, but the very fundamental thing that we don't think about much is JavaScript, the language itself. I hope that this talk inspires you to look outside JavaScript and explore other alternatives out there. And hopefully, you will end up with a well-designed language that will make your life easier. Thank you very much.